All right, everybody, we're ready for our next chat. Um, so my name is Justin McCarthy. I'm the co-founder and CTO at StrongDM. Um, it, looks like I, it looks like I also have some other titles on there, farmer, coder. Um, and of course, today we're going to be talking about continuous authorization. Um, first, though, just uh, a, a tiny bit about StrongDM. Um, we've been around for a while, uh, and at this point, we have customers um, really in every industry you've heard of, uh, from banks to crypto to retail. Um, and uh, all of those customers have one thing in common, they have sensitive workloads to protect, okay? Um, uh, we actually have many capabilities within our product that um, would be focused on what you would traditionally call PAM, PAM or privilege access management, um, as well as, uh, as you'll see today, a lot of cloud-native uh, fine-grained authorization cases that are um, uh, supported by actually a, a language that you're going to hear a lot about called Cedar. Um, so, uh, first thing we're going to talk about is we're going to go back in time a little bit to a time before we had consistent single sign-on, okay? So this is an era when authentication, the way that we log into our systems and establish our identity, was actually uh, completely custom according to each application. So one way to think of this was for N applications, we were asked to remember N passwords, okay? That's the way computers worked at the beginning of time, all right? Um, and thankfully, we all got together as an industry, all the people in the audience here, uh, and said, maybe we can have some standards around authenticating. So then, we can actually transition from uh, custom authentication, that's application specific, to some form of unified authentication. So that transition, I think we all benefited from over the last uh, decade or so, and I, I, I know I'm happy to remember uh, far fewer passwords than I did uh, in the 90s. Um, now we're in an era where authentication is, you know, let's say, let's just call it solved, okay? We've got patterns, we've got mechanisms, we've got products. Um, however, once you've logged into that application, and once you've established your identity, uh, deciding what's possible, what you're allowed to do, and what you're not allowed to do, this is in, back in that state of essentially completely Wild West custom per application, okay? Now, this observation has been made before, um, and actually there have been attempts to solve this and standardize uh, authorization across applications. Um, however, I'll note, you know, it's 2025 now, essentially, um, and we're, we're still struggling with this. We still have very, very different authorization models when you're moving from Salesforce to AWS to my desktop applications. Um, these are just very different worlds, um, and we need metaphors, we need APIs, we need standards to begin to bring these worlds together. Okay? Um, thankfully, uh, this vision and this hope of a unified authorization system, um, uh, there are folks uh, uh, at AWS that have been thinking about this for a long time as well, and over the past several years, they worked on a language that you're going to hear about today, uh, Cedar. You may have heard uh, in other contexts here at the conference or even last year, um, this is a, a language that we identified early on was a, a really great fit for the kinds of authorization cases that our customers cared about and that we wanted to enable uh, at StrongDM, okay? So let's, uh, let's go into a little bit of the detail of why uh, Cedar specifically is such a powerful metaphor uh, for um, the, uh, the kinds of authorization we want to perform. Okay. So, um, reflecting on some of the technical differences between this, the process of establishing authentication versus authorization, um, fundamentally these are just different problems of different mathematical size, okay? So if you think about establishing your identity, uh, we're relying on cryptographic primitives that are fairly standardized at this point. Um, uh, does Justin have a key uh, that identifies him? Okay, that's, that's essentially what, you know, uh, a pass key, a web authen, a biometric, they're all essentially doing this under the hood. You can think of that as a single operation, and it's fairly uniform and universal, okay? However, is this specific action allowed on this specific record? Uh, at this specific time, uh, the inputs into that decision are far more diverse. Who is the identity that's involved? What object is being operated on? So what resource is in scope? Uh, is this a multi-tenant system? Is the, is it, uh, the tenant matching the intended tenant for that action? Um, maybe even there's a time dimension. Maybe there's a when involved in this. Uh, maybe actually there's some network properties associated with the where. Uh, is this resource in a geographic region that I'm entitled to, to operate on or to see? Okay, so you can see that these many, many inputs and, and, and more, maybe, you know, is, do we have the right level of TLS on 
this network uh, connection, for example. Um, all of these inputs go into ultimately an authorization decision, and this is part of what leads to the combinatorial explosion that makes this a much harder problem than, you know, is this Justin or not, the Boolean true false Justin or not, okay? Um, better. Okay. Another aspect uh, that is actually constraining really a lot of our ambitions for modernizing um, all the workloads that we support is we need end-to-end -end, uh, agreement on authentication. So I, again, I think we've established, uh, made some substantial progress on single sign-on, on authentication standards. However, we're still in a situation where many of the back-end resources have no shared language for some of the additional authentication elements, for example, uh, a standardized way of conferring multi-factor throughout the system. Uh, a standardized way of communicating um, what constraints on authorization need to be carried throughout this connection, okay? Um, by thinking about this authorization language and sort of embracing some of the flexibility of Cedar, uh, we can actually achieve a, a pretty exciting decoupling between how you authenticate and then how each resource ultimately authorizes that next action. Um, what we found with our customers is it's kind of freeing. Um, you can feel free to modernize, for example, uh, bringing your humans uh, that are part of the system up to the most modern standard of passwordless authentication, while you know perhaps your Kubernetes cluster um, can continue to use use a certificate-based authentication scheme and not really having to couple those two constituencies together at a technical level, okay? Uh, that decoupling allows you to make progress on each independently, uh, which in a complex enterprise is essential that you can essentially have these parallel projects, okay? All right, so when it comes to thinking about how we're actually going to uh, uh, perform authorization uh, at scale, uh, uh, at a fine granularity, there are actually some really important deployment um, considerations, uh, especially the finer the grain and the closer to real time you aspire to. Uh, at StrongDM, we always aspire to the finest grain and the most real time, okay? And so what that means is uh, when you're thinking about uh, whether you can afford, for example, a network call um, over HTTP to uh, you know, any, any kind of a service to perform a, a, a yes, no, up, down on a particular authorization event. Um, uh, that's something you really have to consider. Um, uh, can you afford that network call? Um, uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, ways, even hosting Cedar, even with AWS itself, um, AVP is a great example uh, for hosting these authorization decisions. You're submitting the context, you're submitting the entities that you're uh, requesting for a decision on, AVP is going to give you back that decision. Uh, at StrongDM, because we had uh, a need for much higher throughput, finer granularity, and that real-time component, uh, ultimately what we determined is that we needed uh, a direct native integration that was present in the proxies that actually facilitate our access. Um, so this is uh, based on the great work of the AWS team. Uh, we looked at the language specification for the Cedar language. We looked at the reference implementation that was uh, provided in Rust. Uh, and then we actually uh, determined that what we needed most was a complete ground up rewrite um, in the language that our proxies were implemented in. So, um, so yeah, I'm happy to uh, point out that um, there's the, the official Go implementation of Cedar that's uh, created and supported by our team. Um, it's in the Cedar repository. You can find it out there. Uh, we actually have a lot of uh, folks adopting it just in the last few months since it's been available. Um, this is suffused throughout our product. Uh, we use it uh, uh, for really for everything at this point. Um, we're pretty happy with it. So. Anyone that has a workload out there, if you're considering Cedar, and if you're considering, uh, maybe you've got some gophers on your team, uh, please send them to this repo. Uh, have them take it for a spin. Uh, it's a lot of fun, it's really high throughput, it's really fast, uh, I love it, uh, big surprise. All right, um, so a note on uh, one of the uh, other deployment consider considerations related to fine grain authorization. So we talked about um, forwarding that authorization request to uh, some sort of a decision point. Um, there's actually, uh, NIST and a few other organizations give us this terminology uh, around uh, policy information points, policy enforcement points, policy decision points. Um, if you look inside a StrongDM node, you, you, you actually have a combination of those concepts. So there is an enforcement point that is essentially embedded into the network proxy. There is a decision point that can accept all of the contextual information, all of the entity attributes, and then render a decision true-false. Okay, so you can, you can ask whether something is allowed, or you can simply try something uh, through the proxy. Um, this actually allows uh, for a really interesting hybrid of 
applications where you control the code, you can actually rewrite your application, hit these endpoints, submit the authorization decision, and get an answer back. If you don't control the code for that application, however, um, it's typically possible to actually intercept those actions and perform an authorization decision in line. Okay, and we're going to see some examples of that today. So uh, I think what we're what we're seeing here is again, this is helping us to make the problem of externalized authorization more tractable uh, because we don't have to wait for 100% rewrites um, for things where we don't control the code. We can just run it through a proxy. Okay. Another note uh, about our approach and the approach that's really supported by Cedar um, to authorization uh, is to really um, be insistent that uh, on session start, once when I log in, authorization, it's just not enough. Um, there's so much that can change during the course of a session. The status of my device can change. The status of my membership in the identity provider can change, okay? So uh, throughout this authorization pipeline, you need the ability to recognize change events and then flow those change events ultimately to the enforcement point, okay? This infrastructure and that pipeline of state change, um, uh, it's not trivial. Uh, it needs to be done, and it needs to be done right, of course, because these are very, very critical decisions. So, um, so even things like uh, the notion of uh, behavioral models that are feeding back into uh, the event stream and you know, commenting on whether this user is performing an action that's outside of their typical normal hours or normal scope, um, that's something that you also want to put into that authorization pipeline, have it delivered to those enforcement points, and then react in real time. And that might mean terminating a session, terminating a result set, uh, uh, modifying a session, or even redacting data, okay? Okay, so, uh, so let's look at some concrete Cedar policies. Uh, I just have a few slides here, and then we're gonna switch over to the demo laptop and we're gonna look at some, uh, some live interactions. Um, so the first one is actually uh, one that's sort of very far afield from uh, a, a lot of backend use cases, but, uh, but I wanna note this is a perfect example of a code base that I don't control. So I don't control the Microsoft 365 console, Microsoft controls that, and yet there's a, a control that I wanna introduce on top of that console that they don't provide natively. So there actually is no way to constrain the ability to edit user contact information based on criteria that I set, okay? I could ask a product manager at Microsoft to please add that feature, and I might be in queued for, you know, maybe a long time in the future. Uh, this is something that I can take responsibility for today, and I can set a Cedar policy and actually have that policy act on the interaction with the Microsoft 365 console. You can even see that I'm modifying the error message, okay? So I'm customizing the underlying application error message uh, uh, reflected uh, through this real-time policy that's applied basically on the traffic uh, uh, between the user and the target system, even for targets like SaaS applications. A uh, little more of a back-end example. You can see here I've got a statement that relates to uh, a particular user interacting with uh, a Postgres-specific action on a target resource. So you can see we've got essentially an ARN there that's identifying a particular database and table inside of uh, a Postgres database. And you can see we're permitting that action. But you can see we've got a couple of Strontium-specific annotations that have enriched Cedar in this case. So what we're asking uh, the engine to do is perform a redaction on a particular column within that data set, and then additionally limit the result set to four rows, okay? So this is just an illustration of a very fluent, very legible policy statement that has a real-time effect uh, on the traffic in flight. And so the net of that is instead of seeing the whole customer table, I now see just four rows, and that one field that we asked to be redacted is redacted, okay? So the same policy language, the same externalized authorization is now commenting on the Office 365 console and some back-end database, right? That, I don't know, that gets me to smile, right? Those are very, very different types of systems, and yet we're bringing them under one umbrella, we have one approach, and it, it seems to scale. It even scales to uh, notions like traditional interactive shells. So I've got uh, uh, you know, uh, a statement here that says, in order to perform a pseudo, uh, I'm gonna have to uh, perform an MFA in real time. Now, this is done in agentless fashion. I'm not uh, installing a, a PAM module on the target system, there's no agent on the target system. At the network level, we're observing the traffic, and we're understanding that the user is attempting to operate uh, a sudo command, and then we're getting that push notification all the way through to our phone, okay? Um, that, again, same surface that's giving us action and traceability across all of these system types, okay? Um, so switching over to the demo laptop now, just to see a few of these examples live. Okay, um, so 
you can always look under the hood. You can see these policy statements in uh, in an editor. Um, you know, but I'll, I'll note that uh, we're not going to force you to learn everything about Cedar. There's gonna, there's a nice WYSIWYG builder for building these policy statements. You can see it's in terms of who, in terms of the principles, all of the resources within your AWS account, and then critically, all of the actions that are very type specific. So you can see there are actions that are related to Kubernetes. There are actions that are related to connection formation. There are actions that are related to relational databases. There are actions that are related to uh, uh, other SaaS control panels and, and uh, even, even something like MongoDB. So all of these actions can be specified and can be integrated with um, uh, really all of these conditions that treat uh, uh, attributes of the location of origin of that traffic or even uh, something like the, the notion of device trust. Um, so in this case, my workstation uh, is integrated with uh, Sentinel One. It's sending an EDR signal rela related to device trust that is then evaluated for each of these policy statements, okay? So the net of that is, let me just cancel there. Uh, the net of that is I've got, let's say, a, uh, an SSH connection. And this is just an interactive you know, SSH terminal session that I'm forming with an EC2 uh, destination. You can see that that EC2 address is uh, uh, contained here in the resource definition. And actually, this resource definition is permitting me to use the underlying credential that's going to log into that system, okay? But before I form that connection, I'm going to comment out that, that annotation that binds the credential, okay? And then I'm going to make a connection attempt. That connection attempt is going to resolve what resources in, uh, I'm intending to connect to, and it actually sees that I can't connect to that resource because I'm no longer entitled to the secret material underneath, okay? Uh, so if I rebind that credential, my next uh, connection attempt is going to form uh, successfully, okay? You can see how all of this is responding in real time to these policy statements that we're adjusting in an externalized fashion in the StrongDM control plane, and it's broadcast down to all of these enforcement points. Once we're in this terminal, uh, you can see here I've got another statement that's forbidding uh, use of LSOF, okay? So I'm gonna type LSOF, you're gonna see that we're interrupting that. Um, but you know what, let's, uh, let's actually instead permit uh, LSOF, but uh, when we do, we're gonna again, we're gonna do a push MFA at that time. So my next attempt to interact with this LSOF is now pushing uh, a, a real-time MFA to my phone. I'm opening Duo in this case, it could, be any, it could be any push MFA, and I'm clicking approve. Only when I click approve is that command actually transmitted to the target, and do we see the response from that command. This pattern then applies really to every technology you type. It applies to web applications, it applies to Kubernetes, it applies to databases, okay? Switching over to a database example just for a moment, um, this is, uh, 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 you, saw, you saw a version of this uh, a moment ago in the slides. Um, but you can see I'm interacting with that customer data set, and then all of the same, all the same rules apply in terms of our ability to, uh, for example, induce an MFA, or you could even, for example, um, uh, ask for a justification in real time. So uh, please share why you're accessing customer data, okay? So I'm gonna click, just hit save on that operation, my next interaction with the database now realizes that you know, this principle, whenever uh, this principle performs a read from that table in the database, we need to prompt for justification in real time, okay? Um, this policy now applies immediately, right? It takes effect immediately, it takes effect globally uh, for any uh, specification of what principles, groups, and resources are involved, okay? So you know, I'm working, uh, working service now, ticket number one, two, three, four, okay? that justification now becomes part of the uh, essentially immutable audit log. So now we have a new, uh, a novel type of audit information that's saying, you know what, uh, where Justin was performing this operation, he was performing a select on this particular database target, we prompted him for justification and he applied, uh, he said this message at this time, okay? Um, just one more example on the, uh, on the database side. Okay, so um, just just like we were able to customize those error messages in uh, uh, back in Microsoft 365 console, because we are decoding at the protocol level, uh, you can see here I've got a specification that says update commands are just going to be forbidden when you're interacting with the customer table, and then we're going to uh, you know not authorized from AWS uh, from AWS stage. Okay, uh, and then the. When we, the moment we attempt to perform that update, it's echoing back to us this error, explaining to the user what's going on um, in, in real time using complete control specified in the policy, okay?
All right, so uh, for anyone that wants to learn more, we've got uh, a ton of reading material out there. Uh, you can come see me after. Uh, I'm easy to recognize, I'm easy to find. I'll be over at the booth. Um, but please, check out cedarpolicy.com. Uh, check out the uh, beautiful white paper that the Cedar team put together. Uh, check out our blog post uh, on Cedar and how we perform authorization at fine grain. All right, that's it. Thanks, all.